Um, uh, it gives me great pleasure now to um, uh, introduce um, uh, Georgie McKenna and uh, my colleague Anna Moore from Cambridge, um, who are going to be talking to us about um, valproate decision making uh, in epilepsy. Um, and uh, we're really, um, we're really grateful for them sharing this presentation that sparked so much interest uh, at our regional epilepsy network. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Georgie. Um, so my our presentation today is entitled Valproate and Ep Epilepsy and should our decision making be different in adolescence? So to start with just a brief overview of what we're going to cover in this presentation. So we're going to start with sort of current state of play in terms of our decision making around Valproate. Then we're going to have a look at the literature on how poor seizure control affects quality of life and mental health in adolescents with epilepsy. And then we're going to look at why should our decision making be different in adolescents, looking at psychological development in adolescents and also the importance of peers and participation in this age group. So to start with, here's the current guidance for the use of Valparate. So it states that Valparate must not be used in women and girls of childbearing potential unless the conditions of the pregnancy prevention programme are met and only if other treatments are ineffective or not tolerated. So childbearing potential means women and girls from puberty to menopause. So if we would take an example case of a 12 year old girl with genetic generalized epilepsy with the seizure types, including generalized tonic clonic seizures. Sodium valparate is the first line treatment for generalized tonic clonic seizures. And this is backed up by the 2022 Cochrane review, which concludes that it's the best profile compared to all other treatments. If this 12 year old was male, she'd be given sodium valparate. However, under the current guidance, it wouldn't be given due to the teratogenic effects on a fetus. And so she would be trialed on lots of the different and other anti-epileptic drugs and only offered with Valparate if they were to fail or not be tolerated. The median age of having your first child in the UK is 28.9 years old. So are we acting in this patient's best interest by treating her potentially suboptimally for around 17 years? And does our decision making need to be different in adolescents compared to adults? So this table from Thompson et al. in 2015 summarizes some of the main factors involved in decision-making of whether to give Valparate as an initial treatment or not. So at the moment, our thinking is very centered around the potential effects on fetus, uh, the risk of neurodevelopmental delay. However, should we have more of a consideration to the, and focus on the psychosocial impact of poorly controlled seizures during adolescence? So when we're making decisions around Valparate, these are potentially the main two factors we need to weigh up. At the moment, it feels like our decision making is more weighted in the direction of protect protecting a potential fetus. You will all be very aware of the evidence around Valparate teratogenicity, so I'm not going to review it here due to time constraints. So this talk is going to focus on this idea of the potential psychological impact of having poorly controlled seizures in adolescence, and whether this is something that should have a greater weighting when we make decisions around Valparate in this age group. So there was a paper by Moetel in 2015 who described six girls with genetic generalized epilepsy in whom Valparate had been initially avoided. Four out of six of them tried multiple anti-epileptic drugs with one patient trying five different reg um, regimes before being offered Valparate. Before Valparate therapy, all six patients had uncontrolled seizures and the psychological impact was described in the paper. They described tearfulness, problems at school, losing interest in schoolwork, friends, leisure pursuits, feeling that epilepsy affected social life, being unable to do straightforward things such as get on a bus on her own and being withdrawn, refusing to attend school and talking about daily harm because of uh, self-harm because of daily myoclonic seizures. All patients were eventually given Valparate therapy and were seizure-free at follow-up on Valparate. So even though these girls were eventually prescribed Valparate and had their seizures controlled, what were the effects on their psychological development of having all these years when they were struggling at school whilst they were having to trial other anti-epileptic drugs? So I had a look at the literature and did literature search looking at the question of how this poor seizure control affects quality of life and mental health of adolescents with epilepsy. Reviewed 16 papers. And the literature suggests that there is an association um, between poor seizure control and quality of life um, or, and mental health. And I picked up one particularly relevant paper. So Reichman et al was a cross-sectional study with data from 489 children and adolescents with epilepsy. 
and they showed that missing seizure freedom correlated with poorer quality of life only in the 11 to 18 year old group and not in the four to 10 year old group. So why is seizure um, control so important during adolescence? And what do we know about psychological development in adolescence? And can we combine this with the literature on epilepsy to explain the relationship in this age group? So adolescence is characterized as a period of rapid growth in biological, social and psychological development. During this period, adolescents consolidate their identity and their understanding of themselves relative to the social world. Adolescence may be a sensitive period for social development, during which the brain is more susceptible to social input and shows increased plasticity in areas of the social brain. Higher social cognitive abilities begin to develop including the ability to understand the mental state of others, and integrate their perspectives into decision-making. Animal research has showed that social deprivation has different, more deleterious consequences on the brain and cognitive development during adolescence compared to other age groups. Therefore, the impact of poorly controlled seizures on the environmental input of adolescence may have implications for social development. We also need to consider what's important to adolescents themselves, such as peer relationships, participation in school and activities, as well as schoolwork and exams. While we as adults tend to focus more on longer term health outcomes, they tend to not be the priorities of adolescents themselves. And this is backed up by some of the data we have from adolescents with brain injuries. So this really busy slide is from the Cambridge Centre for Paediatric Neuropsychological Rehabilitation. So what it shows is it shows that the rehabilitation goals of children and adolescents with brain injuries. So as you can see, whilst medical outcomes on sort of the left-hand side of this slide make up a sizable part of their rehab goals, more surprisingly, a similar proportion of their goals were directed towards participation, relationships with friends and school, and they were particularly important. They also showed that adolescents had increased preference for support and relationship goals, whereas younger children had increased preference for recreational goals. So this just shows that when we're considering the perspective of adolescents, we can't always assume that they'll have the same goals and priorities as us as adults. So we're gonna first focus on the importance of peer relationships in adolescents and specifically how it links in with the stigma of epilepsy. So there's a whole body of literature which looks specifically at peer influence in adolescents. And here are some key points. So during adolescence, peers become an increasingly important part of the social environment. Amount of time spent with same sex peers increases in adolescence, peaking at around 14 years old. Peer relationships allow adolescents to practice and refine advanced social skills. Adolescents are more susceptible to peer influence than younger children or adults, and they allow it to have a greater influence on their own self worth. Furthermore, adolescents show a hypersensitivity to social exclusion, with teenagers reporting a greater decrease in mood following social exclusion compared to adults. Avoiding the risk of social exclusion by peers can be more important than potential health risks of the decisions for adolescents. And that might explain, may explain why adolescents take more risks when they're with their peers. So why is this important? Well, social exclusion has been shown to affect adolescents' mental health. Badcock and Allen in 2003 proposed the social risk hypothesis of depression. So this proposes that depressive states have evolved to minimize the risk of social rejection by facilitating a risk averse approach to social interaction. And they suggest this particularly applies to women as they are more likely to perceive social threats and make more negative self evaluations on the basis of interpersonal feedback. And this link between social exclusion and mental health is shown in the data. Studies show that there is a correlation between peer rejection and adolescent depression and that good quality friendships in adolescents are associated with better psychosocial outcomes. And we know that adolescents are particularly vulnerable to mental health issues. 75% of all mental health problems start before the age of 18, with girls being particularly vulnerable. So therefore, the impact of being excluded by peers, for whatever reason, is greater at this stage of life, especially in girls. So how does this relate to epilepsy and seizure control? So epilepsy has long been associated with stigma due to the fact that epileptic seizures are unpredictable and they're seen as frightening by the public. And there are multiple examples of this from the literature. Many studies have shown that increased seizure frequency is associated with a greater perception of stigma. 
and it's been argued that visibility and controllability are the most important dimensions of stigma. Therefore, lack of seizure control makes epilepsy more visible, so it's harder for adolescents to avoid stigma. And then stigma related to epilepsy has been shown to be associated with poor psychosocial health outcomes. This includes low self-esteem, higher anxiety, lower quality of life, increased worry and negative outlook on life. Therefore, combining this with what we know about adolescents' hypersensitivity to peer influence and social exclusion, it is likely that this stigma has a greater effect in adolescents than at any other point in life. So next we'll look at how poorly controlled seizures may impact on participation during adolescence. So these are some quotes from Teenagers with Epilepsy from two papers, and it shows how epilepsy impacts on participation, especially in this age group. Um, they describe they cannot do things, that, that their friends will choose other people who are more fun and exciting, that they don't get to do the same things as their classmates, they don't have the same things to talk about, so they're, they're the odd ones out. They feel left out because they can't go out with their friends and that epilepsy is like a barrier. And epilepsy has been shown to restrict participation in both school and social activities due to adolescents avoiding activities to um, prevent seizures, fatigue after seizures, parental worry and institutional barriers such as school and teachers. And participation is important. Studies show that restrictions due to epilepsy negatively correlate with overall quality of life. Another aspect of whether adolescents are able to participate in activities with their friends is how, that, how well they feel their seizures are controlled due to the worry about the social embarrassment of having them in front of their peers. Studies have shown that adolescents' fears about seizures and worry about the reactions of others to their seizures correlated with increased risk of anxiety, depression, and decreased quality of life. Self-management efficacy is a person's confidence in their own ability to manage their condition and it's been shown to be related to less seizure-related worry and more positive attitudes towards epilepsy. And self-efficacy itself has been shown to moderate the relationship between seizure frequency and health-related quality of life for most adolescents and young people. This suggests, therefore, that adolescents' confidence in their own ability to manage their illness may be a key process underlying resilience and an important factor affecting quality of life. Therefore, making sure we involve adolescents in the discussion about what anti-epileptic drug they should have and potentially giving them the option of Valparate to give them more control over their seizures could help improve their self-efficacy, improve their quality of life and psychological well-being. So finally, just to consider the importance of school and exams. So in adolescence, one of the greatest causes of stress is exams, especially GCSEs and A-levels. And this slide shows some of the ways that seizures, some of the ways that seizures can impact learning, such as through cognitive impairment, worsening of control of seizures during stressful periods, absences from school, and tiredness. So it could be potentially even more short-term view of treatments during ad adolescence in order to help these te teenagers get through these really stressful periods, then reassess options, and then consider different drugs later on. So in this presentation, we've discussed some of the reasons that we might need to reconsider how we think about Valparate in adolescence. But obviously, teratogenicity is still a significant problem. So if we were to prescribe Valparate more regularly, how could we reduce this risk? Can we learn lessons from other specialties and their use of teratogenic drugs? So isotretinoin, also known as ruracutane, is used to treat acne and is still prescribed to girls of childbearing potential despite being teratogenic. In fact, a significant number of the um, people on uh, Rakutane are teenage girls. They have a clinic every four weeks run by a specialist nurse where you have a negative pregnancy test at the clinic and the patients only prescribe 30 days of drug at a time and they need to be on two forms of contraception. So although isotretinoin is only a six month course of the drug compared to the longer term use of Valparates, there would obviously need to be differences and clinics every month would require a lot more resources. But this model does demonstrate these high risk drugs can and are currently being used safely in adolescent girls. So to conclude, Valparate is the most effective drug to treat genetic generalized epilepsies, but it is the most teratogenic. Um, and poor seizure control affects the quality of life and mental health of adolescents. And do we need to have different considerations when making decisions about Valparate in adolescents compared to adults? By restricting access to Valparate as a first-line treatment, 
we potentially risk unnecessarily exposing this group of patients to a prolonged period of poor seizure control during adolescence, which could be a sensitive period of development during which the brain and mind are undergoing substantial change. So whilst at the moment our decision making has arguably been weighted more towards considering the risk of the unborn, the risk of the unborn fetus, and that if the patient later wants children, then she, she would have to switch medication. Maybe we need to shift how we think about this, resulting in a more balanced view, weighing up both teratogenicity and potential psychosocial effects of poorly controlled seizures. Currently, the guidelines are often misinterpreted, with clinicians taking a completely risk-averse approach and indiscriminately avoiding valparate for all women of childbearing potential. Instead, do we need to consider a more individualised approach tailored to each patient with shared decision-making central to this? Yes, valparate should only be used in the context of a fully informed consent and um, a robust pregnancy prevention service, but it should not be indiscriminately avoided because of the challenges of providing this. We need to balance both the risk for fetus, but also the risks, the psychological risks to a teenager of having uncontrolled seizures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgie. Um, uh, that, that was a fantastic presentation. And I think it's, it's so helpful to, um, to, to fertilize that discussion about um, uh, balancing risks. Um, uh, uh, and, and so often I think that our colleagues around the country who are looking after um, uh, young people with, with epilepsy um, uh, have to adhere to really quite strict guidance, um, uh, which and you've you've beautifully illustrated um, uh, some of the um, psychological and self-efficacy um, consequences of that. So thank you very much. Um, uh, one question in the um, Q and A: um, uh, Could there be long-term effects from the adolescent age that affects having a child? Um, so a question there about the long-term impact on um, uh, fertility and um, teratogenicity, teratogenicity of valproate. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy to field that one on your behalf. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I don't think there's uh, any evidence for that. Is there? Oh. No, that's right. So um, uh, I'm sure, Anna, um, do, do you want to, to speak from the floor as it were on that one? Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be spoken for on this matter. No, I, I, um, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, we know that there is the risk of polycystic ovary ovarian syndrome that we're aware of in long term use of valproate. Again, something that's to be considered. But our understanding is that when you come off the valproate, then it, that it actually it doesn't impact that sodium valproate doesn't impact on fertility, and that the, the risk of the teratogenicity um, falls away when you're not on the drug anymore. So you know. That in itself, I don't think we should be, is a significant consideration here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could, could I ask, um, uh, what, if you were to propose um, sort of simple measures that um, uh, the people at this conference right now could use when they go back to their um, patients this week and next, um, discussing the use of Valparate with um, uh, young women of childbearing age, um, what, what, what simple um, uh, processes or tools could they use um, uh, to, to, to start to put into place what you've, you've suggested? So, um, I'll, well, Georgie thinks I'll, I'll say the thing that is possibly a little irreverent, but to me is the biggest question is, if this was a 13-year-old boy in front of me, what would I be doing and what questions would I be considering? What drugs would I think of? And how would I be thinking about quality of life? So from my perspective, if, there was a th if, if the tables were turned and this drug caused difficulties, if, if, if the father of the child, the unborn fetus, were on the medication during pregnancy, would I be saying to a 13 or 14 year old boy who's perhaps, you know, playing football, going on school trips, but living a very busy, active life, well, you know, you might father a child in 10 or 15 years time and that might, this drug might present a risk to that unborn child in 10 or 15 years time. So in light of that, I'm not going to suggest that you go 
on the best medication we think we have available, I'm going to suggest that you go on something that's less likely to control your seizures, more likely to impact on your life. Uh, and and uh, as a sort of, you know, because because the risk is, is there in the future. And I think I am concerned that some of our, our healthcare advice here is quite gendered. Um, and uh, so I think that would be the thing that I'd be saying is what advice would I give? Is, am I, what advice would I giving a, a, a teenage boy in these circumstances about medication if the tables were turned? Am I really acting in the best interests of the young person in front of me right now, rather than the situation they might be in in 10 or 15 years time? Um, so, so a, a, a proposal for us to take back then to the um, sort of variation in care working group might then be that um, uh, that it, this is less about um, whether valproate is used as a second or third line um, treatment and and is um, uh, viewed less preferentially in girls than boys, but more about making sure that people mitigate risk and um, document. Um, that they have had a full um, uh, a, a conversation with a, a, a competent young person um, and come to a, a sort of mutually agreed decision mm. using the available um, tools provided by, for example, the MHRA. Yeah, I, th I think so. And, and I, I think, Richard, you know, quite commonly we have people saying, well, actually, this child's, this girl's 11 now. She's well controlled on surgeon valproate. I think I probably ought to be moving her on to lamotrigine soon. And that concerns me because I'm not sure that that is acting in the best interests of the child. Um, we know that peer relationships and participation are more important than any other relationships for teenagers. And they are also more important then than at other times of life. So we've, I think what, what we've, been running the risk of doing is taking quite an adult perspective on what a child needs rather than actually saying to the young person what what really matters to you uh, what are the priorities for you in your life at the moment and how can we best support you um, to safely achieve that and achieve participation in the life that you want to be living at the moment we, we've heard reports of girls you know who um they, nobody will go to the toilet with them at lunchtime at school because they might have a seizure. Nobody wants to share a room with them on a school trip or, or, or they, they don't have access to really key kind of aspects of social participation, everyday things, not, not necessarily big dramatic event, uh, sort of adventurous things, but the really kind of core parts of, of no, what one might call normal, but life that other people access easily without this condition. So, uh, Um, I, I have a, a, a number of other questions on the chat. Um, uh, so um, uh, there is a, one of the questions is, um, is it appropriate or inappropriate to have a 12 year old on highly effective contraception when there is no relationship happening? That's a really good question, isn't it? And again, it's about sitting down and talking to people, talking to the, to the young person, talking to their family about the situation that they find themselves in at that time. So I may have a view on how appropriate that is. I'm not sure that's quite for me to, but I don't know. I'd be interested to know what other people think about that, but I'm not sure it's appropriate for, for a young child, a child as young as that. And we know that young people with epilepsy are often a little less able to access independence uh, or, or often a bit later accessing independence uh, in teenage years, so often slightly more protected than their peers. So uh, I think that would have to be and need to be a conversation that was had with the young person and their family. Oh, we, we know that the pendulum swings on this, don't we? So um, uh, there was a point it does. when um, uh, we were being we were being asked to recommend um, uh, that uh, eight year old girls should have a coil put in if they were going to um, use valparate. Um, so obviously um, everybody pushed back very hard on that. And, and and so the pendulum has moved further away. But they're, they're you know, resetting exactly where that pendulum is now is um, is key, isn't it? Yeah. It's an iterative process, isn't it? I, I think the, the, for me, I, I, I've been increasingly concerned that our emphasis is on fetuses who are, may never even be conceived, and if they are, may not be for a long time, rather than the, the young person in, in the room in front of us. And I was thinking about a comment that Colin made earlier on about supporting children and young people with epilepsy to live their own very fulfilling lives, uh, not as patients. Uh, but uh, an independent, fulfilling life. And I, I think that's that's critically important. That's where our emphasis and our, our focus needs to be. 
Um, uh, another question, um, uh, is there data available uh, of uh, on potentially increased risk of SUDEP in adolescents who missed out on valproate? So uh, that's a really difficult question. I, I'm going to say no, I don't think there is any specific data. I mean, we know what the risk factors are, don't we, for SUDEP? Um, and we part of what we're talking about here is um, how long is it until you get the best possible control for this young person that you can? So uh, there, there is clearly an argument that by in some young people, by delaying or by not using the drug that you think is most likely to be effective straight away, you may be increasing their risk of SUDEP. Uh, but there isn't any uh, data that I'm aware of that relates specifically to that group because it's not something that we ca often tend to capture. Um, uh, there is a question here. Um, so uh, it comes in several parts. Um, uh, so your talk was really helpful, but um, uh, A, um, a ter teratogenicity is not the only adverse effect. Um, mm. Young people are already very concerned about their excess weight, which impacts on mental health. Uh, B, um, how do you change um, a young woman to a potentially less effective anti-seizure medicine just as she's wanting to start a family? And C, is there anything else uh, effective on the horizon? I would say in terms of timings, I mean, I suppose for changing your medication, there's never going to be a good time, but that should be almost a conversation you're having with the patient and with their family of like it like if we give them a fully informed like make, make sure they're fully informed and have all the information of if you're if you want a child later on you will have to have a period of switching mm -hmm. but you might be more controlled throughout your adolescence but if they don't want that then they can say oh no we'll try something else now so I think the whole thing is just to do with being fully informed but giving people the option I think mm -hmm. that's what all the literature shows is that if the adolescent feels they're in control and feels like they are managing their own epilepsy, then that really helps their psychosocial outcomes. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think in terms of timing, it's just giving people the choice. Exactly, and, and, and I think, again, to say, we, what, when we bear in mind what we know about what, what the, just how critically important this period of adolescence is for psychological and emotional development, then, um, we could, you know, we know that adverse events at this period have a particularly big impact on young people. So missing out on something when you're 15 is very different from missing out on something when you're 25 or 30, whether that's a social event or a social opportunity. Or so, we the, the the argument that comes back is, which is I have had had come back to me from pe people who work with uh, adult with with epilepsy as well you'll have to change it in 10 or 15 years time anyway so why why not do it now and i i think that we're talking about quality of life at an incredibly important period of people's lives so to say well to be able to sort of say well, we can give you this this drug for the next 10 years and we may need to change again in the future is um i think not a reason to not do it um so i, I agree with georgie it, and, and many young women may never may decide not to ever have children. It may never be an issue. So, so trying to second guess in a teenager what their plans may be for having a family or not in the future, I don't think is, I think that's the bit that's not appropriate here, actually. Um, in terms of, of, of weight gain, that's absolutely right. That we do know that increased appetite is a side effect for some people of sodium valproate it probably goes along a little bit with the sedative effects of the medication um, and I think again when you talk to any young person about starting anti-epileptic medication if we're talking about a 15 year old boy starting valproate that would be one of the things that we would consider when supporting them with their choice. And the question about whether there's anything better coming over the horizon is a very difficult one, isn't it? Um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned Dana, but um, I was an author on Sanad, Sanad 2. No, um, I don't think I've, uh, you've ever said that to me, Richard. I think, I think no. I'm sure I mentioned it. Um, but the N, of course, is for newer. Um, so um, we, we keep comparing newer drugs with Valparate, um, but none of them has yet won. <laughs>
Um, so um, it, it, as, as it stands, then um, the Valproy is still standing strong there. Mm. Um, I, I thank you so much, um, uh, Anna and Georgie, and um, please pass our, our um, thanks to Professor Blakemore as well for um, her insight into the, the adolescent brain and, and the importance of, of autonomy in, in decision making. Um, uh, so we're going to be, um, uh, uh, we, we, we need to have detailed conversations and uh, for the love of God with Epilepsy 12, please document them. Um, uh, it's, clearly, it's clearly important that the, those um, uh, conversations are um, uh, properly documented and properly supported by high quality materials so that those young people can make the right choices in their best interests. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and any last words before I take us to the break, Dr. Dr. Moore or, or, or Dr. McKenna? Uh, just a salute from me to Georgie, who um, started, it shows you how long it's taken to get this far. She started this project as a medical student and now she's a qualified doctor. So um, she hopefully will get it published before she's a consultant. <laughs> um, but um, no, she's done an absolutely amazing piece of work here, pulling together data from an enormous area and, and, and um, went along to dermatology clinics, did all sorts of extra work. She's done a great job and very grateful to her for it. Well, I, I know that it, it, it shifted the perspective of the Eastern Pediatric Epilepsy Network when you presented this. And, and I hope that, that we, can, we can nudge the perspective of, of 400 people today on, on, in this conference. So really, really grateful for the um, presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for inviting us. Thank you. Uh, so we will now go into a break and um, we shall return at um, 3.30. So um, uh, there is time, but not for a, not but for a com comfort break, but also for caffeine. Um, and um, uh, I'm really looking forward to the um, SUDEP presentation that we will be hearing after the break. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And we will see you at 3.30. <laughs>